Thank you. So this is part two of the uh, talk on the satellite sea surface temperature and salinity observations and their roles to constrain models. And today's topic focuses on salinity remote sensing, which is a new frontier in satellite oceanography. So this is the outline that I quickly went through yesterday. Uh, so first, I'll provide an overview of the satellite salinity missions and the basic principle of retrieving salinity uh, from satellite uh, L-band sensors and the calibration validation issues and the error characteristics of the uh, satellite products. And then I'll give a very quick summary of the accomplishment of the satellite salinity and give just a few highlights of the examples uh, for ocean processes, environmental mon monitoring and you know, in improving seasonal interannual prediction and so forth. After that, I'll describe the ongoing uh, challenges and technology development to further improve the satellite observing system and some example for satellite salinity for constraining ocean models. Uh, so all satellite remote sensing, uh, actually including airborne, um, have been based on L-band with a frequency of uh, approximately 1.4 gigahertz. So why is that? So there are two reasons. Okay, thank you. So the first reason is that uh, the L-band is a protected band for use by uh, radio astronomy. So there's less interference by other unauthorized uh, radio transmission into that band. The second one is that it has a relatively good sensitivity to salinity. And here is just one illustration of the sensitivity of uh, brightness temperature measured by the L-band satellite uh, to salinity as a function of radio frequencies. So this is L-band and this is going towards uh, C-band. And F at the lower frequency is the P-band. And at L-band, it's not the best sensitivity, but it's a protective band. So it was chosen for that purpose. And in fact, L-band uh, radiometry uh, has more application than just ocean salinity. And in fact, the bigger application for LPN radiometry is soil moisture uh, and uh, uh, freeze and thaw states. And it also can measure uh, thin CI thickness up to about 30 and 50 centimeters, as well as high wind, uh, very high wind, uh, higher than what KU band or C band scatterometer can typically uh, measure. So Mark Raza can tell you why that is the case. So uh, the first L-band uh, remote sensing measurement demonstration was from the Skylab back in the 70s. So it was a very preliminary demonstration. Uh, here is a, um, a salinity, and that's the antenna temperature. And you kind of see a slope. It's really large spread, but it's a preliminary demonstration that it might work. And that was documented in a naval research research lab uh, memo. And then later uh, in the 90s, uh, the Navy has flown a lot of these flights um, using this uh, instrument called, I think called step frequency L-band microwave radiometer, which is still now operating by, uh, operated by a company in Massachusetts called ProSensing. And I had a lot of communication with them recently, uh, looking at the possibility of using their lightweight chip radiometer for some airborne uh, measurements. So the precision of that instrument is roughly about 0.3 to 0.5 PSU, uh, depending on how you average it. So here is an example of one of the uh, airborne campaign uh, in the Chesapeake Bay area. That's climatological contours of salinity. And these two maps are two, time, two mappings by the airborne campaign that resolve the salinity plumes in the Chesapeake Bay area. So if you take a cross section across the flight track, uh, there's a ship measurements in black and the uh, airborne sensor measurement in uh, magenta. So you see that it tracks quite well. Roughly the, the difference here is on the order of about 0.3 to half of a PSU. And there was roughness correction that was taken care of. It's very important because flat sea surface can give one emission. When a surface is rough, it gives another L-band emission. So you need to remove that effect. It's not a salinity signal. They did that by using a uh, step frequency, 
C-band radiometer uh, that measure the wind. So uh, salinity, light, scalarimetry, or you know, altimetry, many of these remote sensing techniques were really pushed by the, the U.S. Navy uh, for military purpose originally, and then now nowadays it's more of an earth science uh, applications. And then in recent years, there have been three uh, satellite missions that have pioneered uh, the uh, salinity measurements from space, uh, all on L-band with approximately 1.4 gigahertz. So the first one was the uh, soil moisture and ocean salinity mission, SMOS from ESA, still operating, launched in 2009. The second one was uh, Aquarius uh, by NASA and Kongnai. Kongnai is the Argentine uh, Space Activity Commission, so it's a joint effort. And so the third one that was launched uh, in early 2015 was the Soil Moisture Active Passive, or uh, SMAP, uh, by NASA. Now the, the main mission objectives for SMOS was both soil moisture and sea surface salinity. Aquarius was designed and dedicated for salinity with a very precise radiometer. And SMAP has a very similar de design to Aquarius. In fact, it was based on the same airborne sensors, uh, but its mission objectives was primary for soil moisture because when SMAP was launched, Aquarius was still operating. So SMAP could have been used for ocean salinity. In fact, it is being used for ocean salinity. And here is just an animation of the, uh, both the uh, Aquarius salinity from the top and SMAP soil moisture, overland and ocean salinity animation together. And in fact, uh, soil moisture was also measured from Aquarius uh, with, though with uh, less accuracy because people haven't spent a lot of uh, time on the retrieval algorithm, but, and plus it's really coarse. 150 kilometers. So for soil moisture applications, you really want final resolution. And uh, SMAP has a footprint, the radiometer has a footprint of 40 kilometers. Its radar has really high resolution, a few kilometers, but unfortunately it failed three months into the uh, operations. So which is a big setback for soil moisture measurements. Uh, it also compromised the ocean salinity a little bit because roughness is very important to take out the false signals uh, due to the scatter of the uh, 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 L-band microwave emission from the sea surface. So I just want to point out here that the simultaneous measurement of soil moisture and salinity are really important in studying ocean land linkages. So I'll give one example of that uh, later on in the presentations. Some instrument, main instrument characteristics. Uh, so all three of them have L-band radiome radiometer, so small. So uh, it's an L-band radiometer with a uh, synthetic aperture uh, antenna uh, with three arms. Each arm is uh, three meters long, and it's an uh, interferometry design. So Rosemary has described in uh, great detail about how the interferometry works, so I won't describe it here. And Aquarius SACD uh, was, oh, by the way, I, forgot, I failed to mention that Aquarius was the NASA instrument. SACD was the spacecraft provided by uh, Kunai of uh, Argentina. So the complete mission name is really Aquarius, Sakti, or Sakti Aquarius, depending on whether you're in USA or in Argentina. <laughs> so the, uh, for Aquarius, there are three uh, radiometers on it, uh, uh, very precise with a 0.1 Kelvin uh, pre uh, precision. This is the most precise L-band radiometer ever built. And it has an integrated L-band radar scalarometer for measuring the surface roughness simultaneously so that you can remove the reference influence. And it's uh, instead of a synthetic aperture, it's a real aperture. So synthetic aperture basically use a bunch of uh, small antennas to receive the signal from different phase and you reconstruct it, the signal. And real aperture is what you see is what you get, the, the signal, uh, no reconstruction. And the uh, antenna size is about two and a half meters. So the drawback of that is that the real aperture tend to have lower resolutions. Uh, SMAP has an L-band radiometer plus an integrated uh, L-band radar, like Aquarius, but the, it has a huge antenna. It's a six-meter spinning uh, antenna, uh, deployable mesh antenna. Uh, so it's a conical scanning that and give a very wide swath, 1,000-kilometer swath. So uh, 
So the uh, SMOS is also give a very wide swath. So describe here some orbit and sampling characteristics. 40 kilometer footprint for SMOS, similar to SMAP, and uh, 20 23 days repeat with a three days of cycle. And Aquarius and SMAP roughly have uh, seven to eight day repeat, but Aquarius footprint is a lot closer, 150 kilometers compared to about 30 or 40 kilometer for SMOS and SMAP. And all of them have a similar uh, Sun synchronous uh, uh, polar orbit with a very high inclination with a similar altitude. Now, retrieving sea surface solution from space is extremely challenging. Uh, tiny little thing matters, such as galactic reflection from the sea surface, which doesn't matter for sea surface temperature, but it matters for salinity. Uh, so there's a long list of things that need to be collected. Uh, so galactic radiation, this is a schematic showing those uh, effects. There's a uh, galactic radiation from the sky as well as reflection uh, from the sea surface. And there's uh, atmospheric effect such as the oxygen, oxygen absorption, water vapor absorptions, and there's ionosis effect. Uh, that has to be corrected, the Far Faraday rotation. And there's the leakage of the land signal and eye signal uh, because the antenna has a main beam and then a side loop, right? The main beam is located at the ocean, the side loop is picking into the ice and land. And because of the brightness temperature variation from ice and land are typically several times to an order of magnitude, larger than ocean salinity. So even though the side loop gain is small, uh, because the, of the large magnitude of the signal, it could contribute to the ocean salinity, contaminate the ocean salinity signal significantly. Those need to be removed. And SST effect, it uh, need to be removed as well. And surface roughness, that's, that's a big one. That need to be removed. And in fact, surface roughness is not just caused by wind. Uh, heavy rain splashing on the surface also cause roughness. And that need to be re removed. But Actual rain effect in diluting the surface, that should not be re removed because that's a real salinity signal. So here is a kind of a simplified description of how salinity is retrieved. So the L-band radiometer measures the uh, microwave radiation from L-band uh, expressed as a brightness temperature. And that brightness temperature is a product of uh, emissivity and SST. Uh, Pierre uh, actually yesterday also described that brightness, temperature, emissivity, and SST. So that's why SST is needed here. And the emissivity is a, uh, a function of the incident angle polarization, uh, horizontal and vertical polarization, surface roughness, and dielectric coefficient, which is itself a function of salinity temperature and radio frequencies. Now, there are three main factors that uh, affect the L-band brightness temperature signal are the salinity, uh, temperature, and the roughness. So essentially, if we take these two out, we should be able to get their salinity signal. And that's, in fact, what the geophysical model function do in the uh, retrieval. Essentially, you take out the effect of SST using the uh, ancillary uh, sea surface temperature data. There's so many SST sensors, as I uh, showed yesterday, right? There are a lot of SST data. And then the surface roughness, you either take it out from the onboard radar scatterometer measurements, or in small case where there's no onboard radar, the ancillary uh, wind data are used either from other satellite measurements or from uh, numerical uh, prediction analysis. And on top of that, uh, a list of other effects, galactic reflection that can be modeled using you know, uh, theoretical understanding of the uh, uh, galaxy and the Earth uh, movements and the land ice signal leakages to the best of a knowledge of how things are vary on ice and land. It's better correct, corrected for land right now than ice. Ice is really a problem. Ice uh, brightness temperature because it depends on concentration as well as thickness. Radio frequency interference is a, is a even though it's a protective band, there's still leakage. And not all the radars are perfect. Uh, C-band radar could have a little bit lower frequency that leak into the L-band as well, not to mention that the L-band radiometer has side loop. Uh, so uh, removing the, that effect is important. Um, one of the recent uh, development, technology development is that the digital filters uh, and technology that is used in the SMAP satellite, it's really advanced. It's much better than the RFI 
detection capability in Aquarius and SMAP. So now we are using actually the SMAP data to help us to uh, correct for the identify the radio frequency interference as well as the land temperature. SMAP does a lot better than Aquarius. So there's a L band international working group that actually help uh, use these uh, advantages from SMAP to help improve the Aquarius and uh, SMOS data. So where do we get the uh, salinity data? Well, for Aquarius and SMAP data, there are two, uh, ver not, not version, two streams of data. One is produced by JPL. The other one is produced by the Aquarius project through remote, sens remote sensing system in Northern California. So both of those are distributed uh, in uh, NASA's uh, Physical Ocean Geography Data Center, uh, PODAC. And so you can go there, just click parameter, sea surface salinity, then you can go to either SMAP uh, or Aquarius. Uh, both set of data are there. Only the latest version of the data are there. The previous versions and the interim version, for example, the version 5, the final version of the Aquarius project data, that's going to be released uh, in a month or two. Uh, it's not there yet. So there will be a public announcement for the release. Then the version 4 that is there will be replaced by the version 5. I understand that some of you have trouble accessing this website. Now, the remote sensing system data are also distributed through the remote sensing system. But the JPL version of the data is only in JPL, so we have to find a way uh, if you are interested in getting the JPL data yet cannot get through the JPL network. And there is another way to get the data, oh, at least there's another portal for that. Uh, ESA has funded a uh, small pilot mission exploitation platform project. Uh, and that project has a, um, if, you, if you go over there, you click on the data, and there's a list, essentially all the different versions and different streams of data, including the various version of the SMAP data produced by uh, Yves Khmer, by Nation, by Barcelona, by you know Hamburg, they are all there, uh, including the higher level data, uh, Aquarius data as well. So far, it's a link. So eventually, we'll see whether it can be a central repository, uh, including the JPL version. That is to be explored. So it, it's a bit of a one-stop shop here, and there will be a lot of visualization and analysis tools, as well as reference data set, such as different version of the Gritty Argo data. Uh, HICOM, NEMO, and, and all this reanalysis data uh, will, will also be there for in a comparison. It's a pretty great resources. So a bit of a counterpart of the GRIS SST website that I mentioned yesterday. Now the uh, main sources for the validation data for satellite salinity are the Argo flow and the tropical mooring, as well as the shipboard uh, CDD and uh, high resolution uh, thermal salinograph TSG data for if you're interested in particular regions. And now, there are two very important issues in assessing the accuracy of the satellite salinity, as it turns out, we realized through the course of the CalWell process. In particular, because the uh, footprint for the salinity data are coarse. Aquarius was 150 kilometers, right? And small and SMAP is more like 40. This is very different from validating SST, where you have like one kilometer resolution. So if you have a point-wise in-situ measurement, it's not very different, hopefully, uh, from the one kilometer SST. But if you have a point-wise measurement and are trying to compare with 150 kilometer average within some time window, there's going to be a representation difference of scale between the two uh, observing systems because there are different samplings. So this is a real important issue. And it's because of the satellite are average within footprint. And for level three data, it's average within, say, a seven to 10 days or, or a month time window. And um, the measurement in situ measurement are point-wise instantaneous. And uh, there are folks who try to look at the level two satellite salinity. And it's still an average within the footprint, but they try to narrow the time window, say to plus minus five days, for example, and find the nearest uh, co quote unquote co-located Argo flow. But even for plus minus five days, and within the satellite footprint, there could still be a lot of variability in certain regions. I'll give an example of that. So for the room in square difference of this co-located analysis, uh, one need to be really careful in interpreting, interpreting what is that RMS difference, because it 
not only include the uncertainty of the satellite salinity, it also includes the difference in sampling. There, that's a very important point that I want to convey. And even if you do in level three data, there's still a representation issue. You know, the Argo maps comes with one degree, right? But Argo does not have the resolution, uh, the sampling to resolve a one degree salinity, say on a monthly basis. So there's still some kind of sampling error that goes into the graded Argo map when you use that to evaluate the level three salinity data. Another major issue, that is a bit of a uh, discovery by combining satellite data and in-situ data recently, is that uh, the near-surface stratification that we haven't quite realized before. Now, the satellite measure the salinity in the top centimeter. Uh, that's L-band uh, radiometric depth. Most of the salinity measurements are shallowest at five meters. That's for Argo. And for mooring, it's one meter. And so there recently there has been specialized uh, uh, in-situ sensors that have very shallow measurements, above one meter, that identify uh, the importance of near-surface stratification, uh, such as uh, those uh, being used in the uh, NASA field campaign called SPURS and SPURS-2, and Jesse Anderson from University of Washington is also involved in some of those work, and she has actually operated this one of those type of uh, specialized sensor called STS, Argo flow. STS stands for surface temperature and salinity sensors. So if you want to know more about that, feel free to talk to her. So here is an example of the uh, salinity variability within the satellite footprint. So we took the high resolution uh, TSG data. Uh, a lot of these are the, from the French uh, voluntary uh, ship observing uh, ships. So we we took the high-resolution data, a long track, right? We took chunks of data within every 100 kilometers, and then we compute the standard deviation within those 100 kilometer chunk. And this is the map of the standard deviation of variability within the 100 kilometer chunk of data. So you see very large, this is saturated. Uh, this is like 2 PSU, the value. So this is saturated at 0.5 PSU. Western boundary current, River Plume area, uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, uh, near the Sea of Japan and Kuroshio, and there are a lot of area that is not sample off Patagonian Shelf. So now, let's remember this pattern. Now I'm going to show you the difference between Aquarius and Argo with the map. Uh, but the, the center of the map is a bit shifted. So uh, this is starting from 180, the other map is starting from zero. But first, let's bear in mind that the color scale here is 0.5. So the map that I show next uh, is 0.35. So if I change to 0.5, color scale, all of this color will be less. So I want to draw your attention to the standard deviation between Aquarius and a grid product from Scripps uh, based on Argo. Now, you see very large uh, standard deviation in high latitude, we know that's a problem for L-band because it's not optimized for cold water. It's for tropics and subtropics. But you also see very large difference near the Bay of Bengal, uh, Eastern Equatorial Pacific, uh, near the Congo River, Amazon Plume, Western Boundary Current, you know, Kuroshio, Gulf Stream, uh, Antarctic Circumpolar Current. A lot of this pattern actually resemble the map that I showed you earlier. If I flip it back again, uh, you see this Amazon area, Congo, uh, Bay of Bengal, Kuroshio, and Gulf Stream. In fact, even this magnitude, it's almost similar to the difference between the Aquarius and uh, the Argo. Now then we said, okay, let's look at the different Argo products, right? Because there are sampling issues in Argo in representing a one degree monthly average. So we took different Argo products. So this is one example uh, between the Scripps Argo product and University of Hawaii uh, Argo product you can see this large difference in the Gulf Stream, Crucio, uh, Eastern Equatorial Pacific, and part of this is related in the tropics is related to the rain band as well as tropical instability wave that are not well resolved or even captured by uh, Argo. They're very transient variabilities. Uh, Amazon Plume, also very dynamic region, Congo River area, including the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, a lot of eddies. So, uh, the Argo sampling is really limited to look at regions with a lot of spatial temporal variability and that need to be taken into consideration when one try to evaluate the satellite salinity. 
So here I make a quick attempt and take the variance of this, you know, square this map at every pixel, take the square of this map, and then subtract it, and then take the square root again to get a standard deviation over here. Now, there are a lot of white areas. Those are areas where the difference between two algo products are actually larger than the difference between the satellite and the algo product. So now if we exclude those areas and take the aerial average of the remaining area, there's a significant reduction from that standard deviation uh, from 0.16 to about 0.12. So now you can do this for different scale. This is on one by one degree. This is three by three degree, which is the nominal spacing of Argo. It's one flow per three by three degree per 10 days. So a month, you got four pops within that three by three uh, degree. So there's still a lot of sampling error here. But on 10 by 10 degree, Argo should be very good uh, in resolving the variability. And so now if you look at the RMS different, uh, the uh, standard deviation, it's uh, less than 0.1 uh, between Aquarius and Argo, and the two Argo products are really consistent. And a lot of this uh, remaining difference uh, between Aquarius and Argo is on a seasonal cycle. So I have, haven't had time to show that. We still have a seasonal bias. We're trying to figure out why. It may have to do with uh, roughness correction, it may have to do with a, a galactic cor correction. So uh, version 5 of the Aquarius data actually is doing a lot better. So there's a significant reduction of this uh, RMS as well. But if you are interested in non-seasonal variability, like tropical stability wave, MJO, Indian Ocean, dipole, and so, you don't see this. It's a lot better. So the standard deviation on large scale uh, between Aquarius uh, version 4, this is, and uh, Argo, it's like 0 0.05 PSU, and that's the large-scale uh, uncertainty of the uh, Aquarius data. So now, uh, just want to quickly summarize the category of achievement for the uh, satellite salinity, not just for Aquarius, but for SMAPs and SMOS as well. Uh, the first one is the uh, studying ocean processes and features, such as a tropical instability wave, Rossby wave, river plumes, eddies, fronts, Marginal sea salinity, so many examples of this, uh, you know, Indonesian Sea, South China Sea, Patagonian Shelf, uh, and the cross shelf uh, exchange, and Hurricane uh, Hayline Wake. And there has also been a lot of work for studying the linkage of large scale salinity pattern uh, with the water cycle, precipitation, evaporation, uh, continental runoff. And there were also a lot of studies uh, of the uh, signature of the salinity associated with various uh, variable, climate variability. MJO is one, uh, Indian Ocean Typo, El Nino Southern Oscillation. And I will give a highlight of uh, effort for constraining ocean models and improving seasonal interannual prediction. And there are also emerging biogeochemical applications. Uh, uh, a few recent papers uh, published, uh, one of that being by Raina Fine uh, from Rasmus uh, Miami on estimating uh, total alkalinity of the ocean uh, using satellite salinity data uh, and other uh, biochemical data. So the most importantly, the satellite salinity observations are filling the gaps of, uh, in, on spatial and temporal uh, time scale for scales that are not resolved or not adequately resolved by the in situ platform. So they are really complementary to the in situ data as a salinity observing system. Now next, I'm going to give a few examples for uh, the uh, achievements, uh, scientific achievements. So the first one was the uh, instability, tropical instability wave. Now, tropical instability wave for a large scale planetary wave that was first discovered back in the 70s from uh, AHRR imageries. There have been decades of studies using uh, SST, ocean color, scatterometry, altimetry. Uh, so is there anything new that one can learn about it? Actually, within the first year of the launch of the Aquarius, we found new features of the tropical instability wave that was not identified before. And when we look at the propagation speed at the equator, uh, it's one meter per second, which is twice as the speed estimate in the literature, very consistently, about half a meter per second. We found one meter per second. Was it wrong? It was not. Turns out that these waves are the Yanai type of waves. They have a higher speed at the equator. The off equatorial type of uh, TIW signatures are more of the Rusby type 
they have like a 33-day period, whereas the equatorial one is like 17, 18 days. And why has that been found before from all these other satellite data? Well, it turns out that altimetry are best to observe the tropical instability vortices at about 5 to 10 north. That has very large signals. Near the equator, there's a very small signals. What about temperature? Well, the largest gradient uh, associated with the cotang, that's the, the uh, cotang edge, is near 2 north. So that's why at 2 to 4 north, if you look at the salinity, uh, sorry, temperature signature, very strong TIW signal. But for salinity, there's actually a significant salinity gradient right near the equator where the salty South Pacific water meets the fresh water from under the ITCC. So if you have the gradient, when you have the perturbation, you see the signal. And that's why the salinity data could reveal that uh, faster wave, uh, whereas all the previous satellite decades of satellite data cannot before. So propagation speed of uh, TIW has implication to eddy mean flow interaction because the speed it propagates relative to the mean flow uh, affects the amount of energy exchange uh, between them. And so another example is for the, uh, even for the tropical Atlantic instability wave that's uh, very weak, uh, Aquarius was still able to detect it. And so one of the major conclusions from there is that uh, previous study based on in-situ data, mostly from temperature measurements, have uh, concluded that their tropical instability was the main mechanism for the uh, TIW in the tropical Atlantic. When we included the salinity, it turns out that the uh, eddy potential energy is uh, contributed by salinity significantly. In fact, if you ignore salinity, you underestimate the eddy potential energy by the factor of three. And there are three terms there, uh, temperature contribution, salinity contribution, and the correlation of temperature and salinity to density. And they reinforce the density variation. So if you take out the temperature salinity covariability, take out the salinity effect, you're left with one third of the contribution in eddy potential energy. So with that finding, the relative importance of baroclinic versus barotropic instability for tropical Atlantic TIW need to be revisited. And now uh, Pierre Reeves showed this uh, uh, very nice work by uh, Nicola Hill uh, using SMOS uh, salinity to uh, track, uh, look at the uh, cold core eddies uh, across the Gulf Stream. And and this is a SST image from the same time, the uh, ocean current from Jason uh, 2 were superimposed on it, so you, you don't really see the signatures. This is summertime. Uh, we, we, we know that, that they don't see cold core eddies. I've looked at enough of this and for my PhD uh, work because in the summertime, the heat flux just caps the mixed layer, so you don't see the subsurface structure of the eddies, but there's no precipitation or evaporation effect to cap off those salinity signature associated with eddies. That's why you see it there. So those data will be uh, are useful for uh, studying the uh, uh, cross-current exchange of uh, salt. And there are other related studies, uh, one recently by uh, Sienia Grosky that looked at the uh, shelf exchange uh, in the North uh, West Atlantic. That was uh, quite interesting as well as um, Argentine colleagues looking at the uh, uh, cross shelf exchange of the uh, Patagonia shelf area. So this is an example for improving seasonal interannual prediction. I am going to skip it and discuss it later. And here, I just want to give one example of using SMOS data for environmental assessment, both of SMAP data, sorry, both soil moisture and uh, ocean salinity. And this is an animation of both of those quantities uh, during the and after a extreme flooding event in Texas uh, back in uh, 2015. So first, uh, actually in this study, we use a whole suite of satellite data, including precipitation. So you first see the precipitation, and then you see the evolution of the wet soil, oversaturated. And I will let it revive a little bit. And then we uh, begin to see this uh, emergence of low salinity uh, from the Texas shelf and later, it actually gives rise to a river plume that we don't understand. We thought the SMAP data must be wrong because there's no river plume there. And as it turns out, when we look at ocean color data, there's a very consistent plume that goes out from there, indicating that that water was of 
uh, 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 land origin. And also we look at the uh, ocean current uh, from JSON 2. It turns out that there was an eddy, there was loop current eddy, there was pinch off before this event, there was looping around here. So when you have that shelf water that came on to the Texas shelf, uh, it actually, that eddy uh, and the, and the uh, along shore current actually helped carry that plume into the uh, middle central of the uh, central northern Gulf of Mexico. And by August, that plume is actually bigger than the almighty Mississippi uh, River plume. So small rivers, big flooding event could actually cause a huge salinity plume that is bigger than the one that is normally produced by the annual discharge of the uh, Mississippi River. And notice that there is a, uh, uh, the largest hypoxic zone or that zone as far as uh, marine organism is concerned in North America uh, is in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And this uh, freshwater plume, uh, they bring two things. One is that they, they bring two effects, one of uh, toxic material, and uh, the second one is that they, they stabilize the upper water column. And if it makes it even just enhance the stratification, it limits the oxygen exchange between the surface and the subsurface, which could, which could mix the hypoxic zone worse. So some of those effects need to be uh, looked at, as well as the potential uh, influence on the uh, coral flower garden bank. Uh, there's a coral reef in that region. So to what extent this will have uh, effect on the biochemical chemistry need to be studied. Now some uh, words about the uncertainty and, uh, of uh, Aquarius data, and this is somewhat similar in terms of the latitudinal structure from other satellites. That is, they are encouraging in the tropics and subtropics, but very poor in high latitude, at least worse by three to five times. And this is an example of that. It's a zonal average standard deviation between Aquarius version 4 and Argo scripts. That's in solid. The dash curve is the difference between the uh, uh, scripts and Hawaii Argo product. So you see that in the tropics and subtropics, it's uh, not bad. It's kind of comparable to the difference between the two Argo product. And this is version four. Version five uh, will still be, be better than this. And, and this here can include the sampling error of Argo, as I mentioned earlier. But you may go to higher latitude, the Argo data, Argo products are still very consistent. The Aquarius is different from Argo, just huge. And we know that that's in part due to the limitation of the L-band sensors. And so that's one degree, 10 degree, with same similar features. So given that limitation, uh, while we are still trying our best to improve the retrieval algorithm, such as using a better SST product in high latitude that I mentioned yesterday, to uh, minimize the influence of the SST error on the salinity retrieval, we are exploring the technology for uh, beyond L-band to do a better job in high latitude salinity. So this is one of the uh, white paper that we submitted it uh, on behalf of a large community of a salinity remote sensing to the uh, U.S. Decato Survey uh, Committee. And, and so, that, so the Decato Survey is every 10 years, the U.S. Uh, uh, commission, the National Research Council, to gather community input and make recommendations to the agencies for what space sensors will be launched for Earth science and applications uh, in the coming decade. So this is one of those for the next decade, 2017 to 2027. So this white paper, we, we advocate for adding a P-band uh, roughly half a gigahertz onto the L band. Now here it shows the sensitivity uh, of uh, salinity to, sorry, uh, brightness temperature to salinity as a function of surface temperature. And the red curve is the L band, you see a significant drop of sensitivity towards cool water. Not so much for P band, which is in blue. When you take the ratio, it's shown down here. In the tropics, using P band doesn't really help that much. But if you go to, L, uh, go to cold water, polar ocean, you gain sensitivity by a factor of two and a half or three times. So which means we can knock down the uncertainty theoretically in high latitude by a factor of three, and then we will have a more uniform error structure for the salinity. You may ask, why wasn't P-band used from the very beginning? Well, back then, the digital uh, filter for removing uh, radio frequency interference was not that well, you know, 15 years ago. So uh, right now, there's very advanced digital uh, filter now. One of that being used on SMAP. We are even developed a better one at JPL right now. So with that, 
we hopefully can uh, mitigate some of the radio frequency interference into the P-band, which is expected to be pretty bad. It's not a protected band. A lot of airport radar, military radar, are on P-band. So now, using the P-band is not just for ocean salinity. It's good for many other things as well, one of them being the CIS thickness. So what is the state-of-the-art the CIS thickness measurement from satellite observing system? Well, we have the radar altimeter and the uh, uh, LIDAR, laser altimeter. And so here is an example for the percentage error for CIS thickness measurement from uh, PyoSat uh, radar altimeter. And so it's very good for multi-year ice. Uh, when you go to seasonal ice, so the maximum thickness of the seasonal ice is about one and a half meters. So when you approach that, the error begins to be larger than 20% and continue to be increasing. Because uh, radar measurements, it's measuring the free, freeboard uh, above the surface, as Rosemary mentioned. For very thin sea ice, the signal to noise ratio for the freeboard is small. So it's difficult for radar measurements to, to uh, measure sea ice thickness accurately. Well, then the L-band radiometer, like SMAP uh, and SMOS, have been used to measure the very thin sea ice thickness measurements. It has some success for uh, thickness up to about 50 centimeters with 20% uh, or less error. But beyond 50 centimeters, it goes up to 100% error. So there's an observing system gap for measuring sea ice thickness, for observing seasonal sea ice thickness between half to one and a half meters. So we are ho because of the longer wavelength and lower frequency, we are hoping that the addition of the P-band and L-band, so the multi-frequency, will be able to help fill this observing system gap and help knock down the sea ice thickness measurement to about 20% or so. Uh, so there's uh, ongoing technology development for these sensors. Uh, next week, we'll be doing a control lab test at JPL, followed by uh, a few tests December in New Hampshire. And then we are hoping to, if all works well, we're going to have flight tests in uh, 2018. Uh, so some uh, highlights of uh, using salinity to constrain models. Uh, well, first of, first of all, why is it needed? Well, the, uh, in models, uh, there is very large uncertainty for E minus P forcings, especially for the E, the evaporation. And so this forcing causes models to drift, especially on a global uh, basis, the global average. And to a common practice to prevent the model drift is to relax the C surface salinity to some chromatology. But in doing so, it tends to suppress the non seasonal signal, especially the non interannual signal. Another complicating factor is that, uh, at least for global models, uh, typically the uh, chromatology river discharge is used because it's just not possible to get a near real time global river discharge all around the world. Some of the rivers uh, measurements from Africa and Asia are really hard to get. I tried really hard to get the river discharge from Vietnam and China. It was just difficult. Um, so that's the reason that very often uh, chromatology is used. Now, here is an example for uh, Mississippi river mouth salinity uh, from a uh, data simulation product. And this is, doesn't matter which one it is, it's all typical. We look at many of this. It, they mostly have a repetitive seasonal cycle as a function of time. But if you look at SMOS and Aquarius, it has huge interannual variability, 3 to 4 PSU, almost bigger than the seasonal cycle. So this kind of interannual variability are not in uh, the global data simulation product because of there's no uh, interannual river discharge. So salinity data could help constrain that. Very important for biogeochemistry, as I mentioned, because it's important biogeochem co-parameters. So uh, yesterday I mentioned uh, this demonstration from the Indian colleagues for assimilating salinity and SSD data to improve surface current. I'm not going to repeat that. And now this is an, an example from University of Maryland group to assimilate uh, salinity and test the impact on uh, seasonal interannual forecast. So what they did is they have three runs. The first one is what's called control run. They only assimilate vertical profile of temperature. Second run, they assimilate vertical profile of temperature and in situ salinity. Third one is vertical profile of temperature and aquarius salinity. And then they test the forecast skill as a function of month and show in here as a, in correlation 
in terms of the skill and the room in square difference with the observed Nino 3 SST. So it's the forecast skill for Nino 3 SST. And for correlation, the one with the Aquarius salinity has a, uh, a better correlation with the observed Nino 3 and smaller room in square difference with the observed SST. So that's an improvement of a skill. And the interpretation of that is because of the better sampling of the aquari aquaria salinity in constraining the uh, mixed layer density. And at, at that time, a lot of the algal flow uh, diverged uh, from the equator because of strong current and upwelling. So the sampling of algal flow were very limited uh, near the equator. So now with the deployment, recent deployment of the iridium algal flow, that does not spend a lot of time in the surface and transmit. It just come up transmit and dive down again. Hopefully they will diverge less and this difference might be smaller. And so Eric Hecker has moved recently to uh, Goddard Space Flight Center. So he is continuing to work uh, with the NASA Goddard model. So here's a preliminary work that he's doing that include the 2015 and 16 El Nino. I'm not going to go into the detail, except that this system now includes a lot more data, sea surface temperature and altimetry data as the control. And on top of that, he threw in the Aquarius and SMAP salinity. And it turns out that during the 2015 and 16 El Nino, there's a significant improvement in terms of the 12-month long lead forecast skill. Now, there are other uh, effort, uh, similar efforts to test the impact of salinity on the 2015 and 16 uh, El Nino simulation. And that's an ESA funding project uh, in collaboration between the uh, UK Met Office and Mekatasyong. Uh, so this is ongoing work. There are preliminary results coming out right now. Um, so I don't have too much to highlight for that yet. Um, and other ongoing effort at the uh, UK Met Office, um, the absolute value of satellite salinity may not be, uh, be that good, but the gradient information is quite valuable because it's uh, uh, high resolution. So here it's showing that the, that the uh, gradient from the model could still look substantially different from the satellite data, so that gradient information could, could help constrain the salinity front in the model. And a list of other ongoing effort. Uh, so Japan Meteorology Agency, the Meteorology Research Institute, uh, they have been doing Aquarius data simulation very early on and have uh, published papers, probably more after that, that, uh, that I may not be aware of. And they show quite a uh, significant impact for a number of uh, 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 regions. Uh, one is the mole water formation region. It actually affected the, the mole water uh, formation rate. And the uh, second one is the marginal seas, including near the uh, Sea of Japan, Indonesian Sea, Amazon Plume area. And uh, the Indian colleague, as I mentioned, has been doing the uh, salinity data simulation as well. So is uh, the consortium for estimating the circulation and climate of the ocean, ECHO, and the German component of uh, Echo called Gecko. So Armand Kuhl from Hamburg had a recent paper testing the impact of uh, estimate, estimating small data. It actually helped correct the uh, uncertainty of the time variability of E minus P. And, and that is because it's, uh, they're using a 4D1 system and salinity is a control variable. Sorry, E minus P is a control variable that you can inversely constrain using ocean data. So that's uh, the demonstration that they did. NOAA has both global and regional systems uh, for uh, aiming for near real-time uh, ocean salinity measurements uh, for short-term ocean forecasts and ecological forecasts. And also heard that the Chinese colleagues are now also beginning to explore the uh, salinity data. So just one message that this is all doing great, uh, but because of the rapid evolution uh, of the improvement of quality of the satellite salinity, so it's very important to communicate with the data product developer to understand the error characteristics of the latest version of the data so that one will not uh, over-constrain the model or under-constrain the model uh, with the satellite salinity data. Uh, last slide, uh, satellite con continuity uh, is not insured. So this is a chart for the three missions. Uh, SMOS has been extended to 2019 SMAP has been extended to 2020. Beyond that, nothing is insured. So the advocacy of the community to, uh, for the continuity of satellite mission is really important. With that in mind, I'll summarize. Uh, satellite salinity have demonstrated the value added to the existing observations 
to improve the understanding of ocean processes, both physical and biochemical, and how the ocean is linked to the water cycle, as well as uh, using it for environmental monitoring, along with, uh, say, soil moisture measurements. And it also has been used to uh, constrain ocean model uh, state estimation, as well as seasonal interannual predictions. Uh, CLI salinity have uh, reasonably good quality in the tropics and subtropics, but very poor quality in high latitude. And we are developing a new technology to improve the high latitude salinities and CI's thickness measurements. Uh, a important message that I stress is that the uh, CLI salinity error characteristics in assessing that, one need to take into account of the sampling difference between the satellite and the in-situ measurements. That is a very important statement because early on it was very confusing in the literature. And lastly, uh, we need the community advocacy for continuing satellite missions. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. I have a My question regarding the last point. What would it take for the mission to be able to provide high-resolution, uh, real-time salinity that can be used uh, a little bit like SST. I mean, what, what are the technological or the steps that need to be taken? So high-resolution as in? In like, uh, I mean, similar to SST, let's put it, uh, mesoscale resolving. Right, so that's a good question. It's a dream. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the lower the frequency, the bigger the antenna you need to gain the same resolution. So one has the choice uh, of, uh, say, if you have a platform that's lower orbit, a uh, space station, you know, uh, that gets you better resolution, uh, or there's uh, something that's called a science station that is being developed by the Silicon Valley. They have visited JPL, could fly in a lower orbit, it could combine modules, like it's different from the space stations that can use a bigger aperture systems. That could help improve uh, resolution. Uh, but uh, so, so there are three elements that has been advocated by the community, improving resolution, nailing down high latitude salinity, and the continuity. So the, the first two are a bit of a competing requirement. So the Decato survey, white paper that I led, we are focusing on nailing down the high latitude salinity because salinity is so important for ocean ice interaction and ocean circulation in high latitude. But the technology needs to be developed for higher resolution, and I cannot see that getting one kilometer resolution salinity to work within the next decade or even longer. So somebody will have to come up with a big deployable cell, you know, mesh antenna. <laughs> That's cheap. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Questions you from the audience? Uh, you mentioned the different layers you measure with uh, uh, with the satellites and uh, with in situ observations, and you mentioned that there might be a, 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 let's say a systematic uh, mm -hmm. discrepancy between both these random and systematic. Yes. yes. So what what is the contribution to this of your estimated errors you have shown? So the standard deviations. Right. So it's in there. Uh, notice that when I remove the difference between two Argo product. Uh, that is bigger than the difference between satellite and Argo. A lot of those areas got excluded because there's large inconsistency between Argo product. Those are areas typically have uh, transient variability. It's a rain band, you know, a lot of patchy rain. So the sampling of uh, Argo is very sensitive to the breeding as well. Uh, but uh, in uh, a proper analysis uh, using this, we should exclude that as well by using rain measurements. So for uh, Aquarius version 5, we actually have some rain flags uh, that go into it, uh, as well as estimated vertical stratification based on some very simple model, rain rate and wind speed. So stratification usually exists at uh, low wind and high rain. Uh, Jess, Jesse Anderson can tell you a lot more about it. Uh, but if you have rain but you have strong wind, they mix only in low wind and heavy rain, uh, they, they are important. Yeah. But it, it's, a, it's a smaller contribution than, than the, those numbers. Yeah. 